I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. We're filming this segment, one of two segments, in Washington with author, former presidential candidate, consumer advocate, lawyer, Ralph Nader. His two latest books, The Emerging Left-Right Alliance to Dismantle the Corporate State, are unstoppable, and then Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President, 2001 and 2015. In this first segment, we're going to talk about the corporate coup d'etat, which took place, when it took place, how it was orchestrated, and it was largely a corporate attempt to respond to the very effective mobilizing that Ralph had done in Washington on behalf of the citizenry and uh, advocacy groups uh, to protect workers' rights, uh, to promote uh, clean water, clean air, OSHA. So let's begin with this. Uh, Lewis Powell, who was the general counsel to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and would later be appointed to the Supreme Court, wrote a memo in August 1971 that expressed corporate concern over Nader's work. Quote, perhaps the single most effective antagonist of American business is Ralph Nader, who thanks largely to the media, has become a legend in his own time and an idol of millions of Americans. Powell goes on to recommend, quote, There should be no hesitation to attack the Naders, the Marcuses, and others who openly seek destruction of the system. There should not be the slightest hesitation to press vigorously in all political arenas for support of the enterprise system, nor should there be reluctance to penalize publicly those who oppose it. 1971, the Powell Memo goes into force, and what begins to unravel? Well, the Powell Memorandum was a combination of illusion and paranoia. Mm -hmm. Uh, He says it was an attack on the economic system in America. Basically, his memorandum laid out a strategy to attack democracy in America. And he basically said to the business community, you got to hire a lot more lobbyists swarming over Congress. you got to pour a lot more money into the uh, their campaigns, both parties, Republican, Democrat. You got to get out on the campuses and get right wing speakers to, to combat uh, progressive uh, speakers. Uh, he had the whole 180 degrees. And, and, uh, and the right wing think tanks were his idea. And, and build more like of the. Like heritage and all. Right, you know, pump money into heritage and all the other uh, corporate think tanks, uh, to use a euphemism. They're just propaganda right, right. Uh, venues. And. What was interesting, I think the commentary on the Powell Memorandum missed the main point. Mm. It was easy to say, he said, look, galvanize, come into Washington like a swarm, media, lobbying, put your high executives into government offices, regulator offices, Department of Defense, and so on. But that wasn't the most successful strategy, although it was successful. The most successful was that the Powell Memorandum led to the massive corruption of the Democratic Party. And that uh, came at the same time that Tony Coelho, who's a congressman from California, took over the fundraising for the House of Representatives Democrats. So what year are we talking about? That was like 1970, 71. Oh, was that early? Yeah. When he basically uh, said to the Democrats, hey, look at all these political action committees. Why are the Republicans raising all this money from business? We can do just as well. And that's when the Democratic Party started going off the cliff. And there was an article in the Atlantic Monthly by Greg Esterbrook, uh, October 1986. And he basically said it worked like a charm because once the uh, money started flowing uh, into the Democratic coffers, there was a big tax bill up. And within a year or so, the Democrats were trying to outbid the Republicans and carving out tax loopholes for big business in return for campaign cash. And so what the Powell Memorandum did was it recognized that if you can corrupt the Democratic Party, the Republican Party would be even more corrupt because they'll try to outbid them for the favor of corporatism. And what what effect did this have on the relationship 
between the Democratic Party and labor. Uh, labor had traditionally been at least one of the pillars of the Democratic <clears throat> Party establishment. Well, labor was put on a defensive from which it's never recovered. At first, it was being eroded by automation, mm -hmm. then by globalization, shipping jobs overseas. Uh, and then they used to represent about one out of every four dollars that went into uh, the two-party campaigns, mostly Democrat. And right now, it's like there, there's 32 to one, 32 corporate dollars to one union dollar going into the... And, and work with. It began working harder and harder for less and less every day, going up to Congress. Is going, that because the number of, of allies within the Democratic Party diminished significantly or because they were bought off or what, what, what happened? Well, they were defeated uh, in the uh, Reagan landslide against Jimmy Carter in 1980. We lost the champion of consumer protection, Senator Magnuson. We lost Senator Frank Church. We lost Senator Nelson. It was just, a, you know, it just it was a disaster. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and then something happened with the liberal and progressive groups here. They lowered their horizons. They hunkered down. Uh, they became very uh, defensively uh, tactical. That is, just to try to stop a few things. They never put forth an aggressive agenda the way Heritage Foundation, Cato Institute, and others have done. And once you're on a defensive in politics, you're on the defensive. You, it's almost impossible to recover. It's like you're back on your heels, 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 you see. And then something else happened. And, and that was that the uh, citizen group started making excuses for the few progressive senators and representatives uh, who got away with kind of plateauing with a few good bills they introduced. But they didn't want to be pushed. And, and for example, Senator Sanders does not like to be pushed well, you know, by you the saw progressives. This with Obamacare. So you saw yeah. groups like MoveOn.org, after Obama walked away from the public option, sending out memos to all of their followers That's right. that you have to, uh, even though he's destroyed the public option, even though Obamacare is written uh, for and by uh, you know, the insurance and pharmaceutical industry, uh, you have to pass it to save the Obama presidency. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the process is, is very simple. Uh, think of a tug of war. 24-7, uh, the corporations are pulling both parties in their direction. And what do the progressive or liberal citizen groups do to try to pull the Democrat party? <laughs> they lower their expectation right, level right. and settle for less. In other words, they're signaling this virus, this sickness called least worst civic advocacy on the Democratic Party. And in the meantime, the Democrats are saying, hey, we got these guys, they're going right. nowhere. So, you know, we can start cashing in more with these corporate political action committees and PACs. So, Ralph, the Powell memo comes out. Corporate money starts going into Democratic coffers. At what point did you become aware that things were changing? Well, it became apparent um, after uh, Nixon was elected again in 1972 in spite of the Watergate scandal. Hmm. Uh, and. Uh, he stiffened his spine. Up until then, he was scared of liberals. He's well, you know, I've heard you say that Nixon was our last liberal president. <laughs> he, was the last, he was the last president afraid of liberals, too. Right, right. He still heard the rumble from the people coming out of the 60s. Right. And, uh, and so he signed into law in his first term the EPA bill, right. the OSHA job safety bill, the product safety commission bill. He wanted a better health insurance system than Clinton proposed yeah. later. He wanted the, uh, the voting rights for the District of Columbia uh, and citizens. And much of that came out of your office. Yeah. And he also uh, adopted a minimum in incomes plan, which Congress uh, split on and rejected to uh, try to abolish poverty. There, there's been no president that had that right. agenda since. This is Tricky Dick, right, the right. red baiter. Right, right. The man without a heart. Yeah. So, okay, the second term. So that's when you begin to see the change? Yeah. And what did you see happening? Well, what were the effects that you... It, it, began, it began with the Democrats looking funny on huh. Capitol Hill. It was like they started going out to these uh, fundraising uh, parties. And uh, Gerald Ford, uh, as you know, uh, took over from uh, uh, Nixon. And he imposed wage price controls, which was you know, c completely out of the range of the Chamber of Commerce. They went crazy over that because there was a 4 or 5% inflation 
that they wanted to uh, tackle. Uh, that gave us a breather because uh, here you had the Republican administration pushing wage price controls. And then Jimmy Carter won the election uh, in 1976. And so we had another breather uh, in the sense that uh, he appointed some pretty good people to run the regulatory agencies. But you could see uh, the beginning signs of the Democratic Party Were you still folding. able to push through legislation, you know, that protected consumers and citizens? Or at what point did that begin to really become impossible? In the mid-70s. In the uh, mid-70s. We got the Freedom of Information Act through in 1974, the Clean Drinking Water Act through. We got a toxic uh, chemical prevention uh, bill in 1976. We got the National Cooperative Bank uh, to fund consumer co-ops in 1978. And, and then it all began falling 